Welcome to some new r slash malicious compliance stories, where people comply to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. I hope you had a great day. Thanks for all the likes and comments on the last video. If you would like to support this channel, please hit the like button and consider subscribing if you enjoy the content. And now let's start with the first story. It's called No Free Food. I work at a gas station as a cashier, usually early mornings on weekends. Our station has a lot of food in store that's packaged like chocolate bars, drinks, etc. But since the prices are so high, most of our stock expires before we can sell it and we have to throw it away. Besides the packaged food and drinks, we also serve pre-made sandwiches and other pastry, which can only be made and sold in one day and needs to be thrown away at the end of the day. Unsurprisingly, prices for those items are even higher and so they are rarely sold and we throw away kilograms of food every single evening. I asked my boss if he could just eat it after it needs to be thrown away because it's still good food but health regulations just say we can sell them after a couple of hours laying in the fridge. My boss said no because he doesn't trust us to not make food in the evening just for us to eat. I countered with the idea of just putting these items on sale before we throw them out. This way we don't have to pay half of our hourly wage or more on a sandwich and customers could save it for a less price. My boss declined again, saying that we can't do that either for some reason. I asked if we could donate everything in the evening to homeless people in the area. My boss said no. Q. Malicious compliance. I've made it my duty to remove everything from the store as soon as it expires and even made a list for my colleagues to look up when things expire. No, we didn't do that before. It just lay there on the shelves until someone found it. With that, every shelf has now empty holes without stock and my boss's office is full of expired stuff because she needs to check every item to make sure none of us is eating it. I've taken my time to add up the amount of food we throw out in just a week and calculated that over $400 worth of food went to the trash in half a week because we didn't discount them. I've asked a lot of our customers about their opinion to implement such a discount to reduce the waste of food and I just got positive responses. My boss however was not happy that I talked about problems with customers and got pretty mad at me. I showed her the numbers I calculated and what we could potentially earn with a discount of 20% based on the customers opinions I got when talking to them. The majority of them would buy more to save food and with a discount they'd much rather buy something. My boss was too stunned to speak when I told her that she's losing thousands of dollars a month to the trash can. But since it wasn't her idea, she's rather losing the money than admitting I'm right. The next story is called Bad Work Environment. It used to be a server at a major restaurant chain that you see in every mall in the US. My particular location just happened to be in one of the wealthier parts of the country. Because of that, a large percentage of the clientele wanted their dishes a certain way. There were some oddball regulars, but 99% of the time they'd ask for a rigatoni instead of penne in a dish, a red onion instead of yellow on a burger or something of that nature. The thing about this chain though is that technically you're supposed to charge them for substitutions like that. So for instance, if a guest wanted a different kind of dressing on a salad, it might be a 10 cent charge. Or if they wanted Swiss instead of cheddar on their burger, it would be like a 15 cent charge. As a server, you were supposed to know all the upcharges. But because there were like 26 pages to the menu, it was daunting enough to just memorize what we even had. But obviously, no one ever charged for these things, because what's an extra 15 cents on a $200 tab? Especially when you're in the weeds and you're pretty sure the host stand wants you to have a mental breakdown. Not only that, but because rich people tend to be the stingiest jerks you'll ever meet, we would never charge them because they would instantly complain if you did. And the restaurant's policy was, essentially, the customer is always right, no matter how wrong they were. We even had regular grifters that would order the wrong thing and then complain and get an entire free meal every freaking time. So one normal day I'm serving a table and someone asks for goat cheese on their salad instead of feta, which is supposed to be one of those 10 cent changes. I obviously don't add the upcharge, just like I hadn't for any of the other countless times in over 3 years. 15 minutes later, the new manager, I'll just call him Brad, comes along and pretty much chews me out over it. Keep in mind, this is Brad's second day on the job and he came from the other side of the country to replace our beloved former manager who left to manage her own restaurant. The dude hadn't even introduced himself to me and he comes out of nowhere to yell at me for not doing the upcharge. I explained to him why I didn't and how it was pretty much a directive from the general manager not to do upcharges because of the 99% chance that a complaint and free meal would follow. But Brad just blah 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 some more and tells me I need to add the upcharges or I'd get written up. 
So when the next table, a party of 7 that had a $500 ish bill, changes literally every dish, I added the up charges, which totaled like $1 at most. When I dropped the check, they freaked out over all the up charges, even though I informed them of the charges when they ordered. The itemized receipt made it look so much more severe. They demanded to speak to their manager. Instead of getting any of the other managers I had worked with for years, I grabbed Brad and made him deal with them. He ended up having to comp all $500 ish because he insisted I charge an extra dollar for all the substitutions. But did he learn his lesson? Nope. So I did it over and over again to the detriment of my bank account. Most people still tipped me though, so that was nice. And I got to watch tables routinely chew him out over the charges. This continued for a month or so until he finally relented and not too long after I was suspiciously fired for creating a hostile rock environment while on vacation. The third story is called Clock Watching. I worked some 20 years ago for a local government agency here in the US. We were a small well-run office with a supervisor who had a very lazy fair style of leadership and this worked. Do your job. If you have an idea, develop a program and we'll try it. If it doesn't work, no harm done. Take what we can learn from it and use that on another program. Many programs develop spontaneously. And there was a very collegial relationship within the department, between everyone from the department head down to the administrative staff and with other departments across the organization as well. That department head retired and was replaced by a retired army colonel who was somewhat dictatorial in his style. Suddenly, there were a lot of changes. We were told that we could not extend our lunch hour by 15 minutes once a week to participate in the local Rotary Club meetings. Despite that, we were expected to be involved in local civic groups as a part of our job. And that we had to take a 15 minute break at the assigned time each day. As might be imagined, these administrative changes did not go over well. In response to the new top-down mandates, the informal leaders instituted policies of their own without ever saying a word. Suddenly, if their assigned break time occurred and they were on the telephone, they explained, I'm sorry, but it's my assigned break time and I have to go now. I'll be back in 15 minutes. Meetings that were ongoing at 4.59 pm were abruptly adjourned with the note that those from the office were mandated to complete their activities by 5 daily and that it would be necessary to schedule another meeting to complete whatever business was on the table. Mind you, these were people who regularly worked with elected officials at the national, state and local levels as well as the public. When lunchtime or 5 came, they immediately stopped work, often simply leaving the file drawer open with the files laying on top as they walked away. It didn't take long for support staff to follow suit. This was not the kind of action to which those that had worked with them in the past were accustomed, nor was it what one would expect from professionals. It was, however, exactly what was mandated by the new program. Nothing was ever coordinated between them or the other staff. It wasn't long before the new department head was getting a call from their supervisor, who also happened to be a retired colonel. The supervisor was suggesting that they get a handle on the situation and fix it. Immediately. Of course, there was no disciplinary action because there were no rule violations. Indeed, there was hyper compliance with the rules established. Things never completely relaxed under the new department head and I'm sure he wondered why there were no more innovative projects proposed. He had effectively put out the spark that was at the heart of the group though and within a year or so there was about a 60% turnover. The last story is called Inspection Compliance. This happened years ago. I just started working as an independent electrician. One day I received a call from a new customer. He was one of those people that flips homes in lower income neighborhoods. I call him Todd. Todd asked me to meet him at a vacant house we recently bought to give him an estimate for a full rewiring job. He was 30 minutes late, so I was already unimpressed with him. Upon entering the house, which was right after a rainstorm had passed through, we found an inch of water covering the hardwood floors. There was water pouring out of small holes in the columns on the front porch. Everything was soaked. Instead of showing me around, Todd called his business partner and brother and spent the next 20 minutes cussing him out for not fixing the roof. I'm standing around and listening to his man baby rage on full display. The whole time I'm thinking there's no way I'm going to work for this guy. His fuse was way too short and his anger was out of hand. I gave him a prize, which admittedly was the I don't want to do this job prize and didn't hear back from him until months later. Todd called me later that year. He explained that he had found an electrician from three states away and he paid the electrician with ceramic tiles instead of cash. The problem now? Well, he needed an inspection from the city electrical inspector. 
I agreed to meet the inspector for him, which I would bill him for. I went back to the house about 20 minutes before the inspector showed up and saw numerous issues. When the inspector arrived, we walked through together. Every issue I saw, the inspector also saw. He pointed them out, and every time I agreed with him that the work was not up to code. This inspector kept looking at me with a puzzled expression. After we did a complete walkthrough, I finally explained to the inspector that I didn't do any of the work and was hired to get him to pass the inspection. He asked me if I thought he should, and I told him, absolutely not. I got paid for my time, I got paid to repair all the violations, and I formed a strong relationship with that inspector, who was always lenient with me on all my future jobs. And with that, we end today's video. Let me know what you think about the stories. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the stories and today's video? I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what I do and want to support me, please subscribe and hit the like button. I hope you have a great day. Stay safe. Bye bye.